Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to circle back a little bit to a previous video and talk about the Bell P-39 Era Cobra, an American-made fighter designed to be used by American forces, but ended up seeing much more success over in the Soviet Union, in part because the Soviets needed aircraft of any kind, and in part because the P-39 performed pretty well at low altitudes where a lot of the fighting in the Eastern Front took place. The P-39 was pretty unique for an early World War II piston-engine propeller-powered aircraft, in that it had tricycle landing gear and an engine that was buried in the fuselage behind the cockpit. While the layout was certainly odd and would require a bit of getting used to, it did have some hypothetical benefits, that may have made it a bit more optimal, from the weight being naturally more balanced, to the nose being able to be more streamlined, to it being easier to concentrate more or bigger guns in the nose. For more on the P-39 proper, you can watch the video I did on it, or, I don't know, I guess you can go to the Wikipedia page or something. I don't control your life. But today, I want to talk about the P-39 Improper, I guess. A plane that was basically the P-39, but also kind of not. A plane based directly on the P-39, just made for a different audience. This is the Bell XFL Aero Bonita. In early 1938, about a year after the Army Air Corps, issued the specifications that led to Bell Aircraft presenting the P-39, the U.S. Navy issued specifications for a new lightweight high-performance fighter, and by April 11, 1938, several companies, including Bell, Grumman, and Vought, all submitted designs to be considered. From Grumman came the Bazaar XF-5F Skyrocket, from Vought came the legendary XF-4U Corsair, and from Bell came an ostensibly barely modified P-39 in the XFL. Just a few days prior, the P-39 prototype had just taken to the air, and it achieved a top speed of 390 miles an hour. At least in theory, this gave Bell a leg up on the competition with the general concept of their plane already showing a pretty decent amount of promise, promise that was backed up by actual full-scale testing. But despite that, though, in June 1938, the Navy issued prototype contracts just to Grumman and Vought. While I'm not exactly sure why the XFL did not get a prototype contract initially, I strongly suspect that it was because of its engine layout, the type of engine it used, and just its relationship to the P-39. The centrally mounted engine was more experimental. It was also to use an inline liquid-cooled engine, which was uncommon for a naval fighter at the time, with radial engines being more rugged and durable. And the P-39 had tricycle landing gear, which also deviated from naval aircraft norms. But by November 8, 1939, I guess the Navy got over themselves, and they issued a contract for $125,000 for one single prototype XFL to be delivered in 300 days' time. The XFL, measuring in at 9.07 meters long, 10.67 meters wide, and 3.89 meters tall, despite looking mostly similar to the P-39, there had to be a lot of small alterations on its design to make it more well-suited to carrier-based life and the Navy's desires. The XFL was slightly less long and slightly wider, all to make taking off and landing on carriers possible. The OG tricycle landing gear was replaced, with a more standard small tail wheel, and the underwing wheels were moved slightly forward more towards the leading edge of the wing. By the tail wheel would be a tail hook, and so the force of the arresting cable pulling on the tail hook when landing 
didn't just rip the plane in half, the fuselage was slightly shortened and also reinforced, in an effort to reduce the plane's landing speed to a required 70 miles an hour, the wings were made to be a bit bigger, and the flaps on the trailing edges were made larger as well. Lastly, because of the more traditional landing gear, the pilot's seat and canopy height were slightly raised, to help him see over the nose and see the ground on takeoff and landing. There was also apparently a requirement from the Navy to have small underwing bomb bays that carried tiny little five-pound bombs to be used as a weapon against enemy bombers. The pilots were to fly over the bombers and using a very small window below the pilot to aim, drop them on the bombers. I'm not entirely sure if these kind of bombs were ever used in any capacity by the Navy. But for the rest of the armament, the XFL was pretty similar to the P-39, just a little bit lighter. Firing centrally through the nose would be a 37mm cannon, and on top of the nose would be a pair of 30 cal machine guns. The XFL was missing the pair of 50 cal guns that the P-39 had, but presumably this was done to keep the weight down. Also missing initially, though, was actually the 37mm cannon, and also the 30 cal machine guns weren't there either. Apparently, they didn't have a 37mm cannon available to them at that moment, so in its place, a 50 cal gun was installed instead. As for its 30 cal guns, they just flat out wouldn't be installed initially, but they would simulate the weight of them through ballasts. Powering the P-39 doppelganger would be a similar engine in the Allison V-1710, specifically the XV-1710-6, an engine that was an effective redesign of earlier Allison engine models with 1,150 horsepower. Bell would complete the mock-up of their XFL in December 1938, and under the 300-day stipulation of the contract, the first prototype should have been ready by mid to late 1939, sometime between September and November. By that time frame, though, the XFL was nowhere near ready to fly, and what they currently had was starting to shape up to be a little bit of a disappointment, or just underperforming compared to what they anticipated. Because the XFL was to be a carrier-based aircraft, and the fuselage had to be reinforced, the weight increase as a result of that reinforcement started to get higher than what they anticipated, a good 8% higher. Even without that weight increase though, the fact that the XFL didn't actually have an engine yet was the far greater concern. Whether it was because of some kind of internal issues over at Allison, there not being enough Allison V-1710s to go around, or the V-1710-6 engine being different from prior V-1710s, the delivery of the XFL's engine was severely delayed. Only on January 4th, 1940, about four months after the XFL was supposed to be ready, the engine was finally delivered. Roughly around this time as well, the XFL would receive its name of Aero Bonita. As far as I can tell, Bonita means pretty or beautiful, so the Aero Bonita was the Air Pretty or Beautiful Air or something like that. Kind of an odd name. But anyway, about five months later, completely by accident, the XFL took to the air for its first flight. Now, how do you accidentally give a plane its first controlled flight? Well, during some taxiing tests on May 13th, 1940, Mother Nature decided to play a little prank on Bell, and while the Aero Bonita was driving down the runway, a strong gust of wind kicked up and took the Aero Bonita into the air, because the pilot, Brian Sparks, was already driving down the runway and had little concrete left in front of him to land, he elected to just pull the plane around for a more proper landing. 
and while he was doing this, flotation bags that were installed in the top of the wings suddenly and unexpectedly deployed. The bags, just sort of flapping in the wind, eventually ripped off on their own, and sparks would bring the plane down safely, completing the unexpected and kind of bizarre first flight of the XFL. The second and subsequent test flights of the XFL were less action-packed, but still weren't great overall. The second flight saw the engine fail mid-flight, necessitating an emergency landing, and further testing throughout 1940 showed consistent engine cooling issues, poor handling, and directional instability. Bell would respond to these issues by enlarging the tail surfaces, and altering the oil cooler air intakes, which helped to alleviate some of the issues, but did not solve them. Still though, with the project running severely behind schedule, and the control issues not fixed but not as bad as they were before, the XFL was passed over to the Naval Air Station in Anacostia, Washington, D.C. on February 27, 1941 for some further testing and carrier acceptance trials. While it was there, the XFL would also do some top speed and landing speed tests, which revealed a pretty disappointing aircraft that was almost guaranteed to fail its carrier trials. They found the XFL to be unbalanced, with the tail being heavier than the nose. The top speed of 336 miles an hour was slightly below what was anticipated, and its landing speed of 78 miles an hour was 8 miles an hour more than the 70 mile an hour maximum. While maybe that could have been overlooked, on May 12, 1941, the XFL suffered a landing gear failure in the midst of its carrier trials, which was basically an automatic failure. But shortly before this landing gear failure, early in 1941, Vought had received a production contract for the F4U Corsair, a move that put the Aero Bonita on very thin ice. It needed to just wow the Navy in its testing, and it failed spectacularly to do so. As a result, the Navy decided not to give the XFL a contract. The lone prototype was then passed over, to a different naval air station in Virginia in early 1942 to be used for target practice, and in 1944 it was transferred yet again to a Maryland base, where it would remain for the rest of the war. The XFL would suffer a sad end post-war, being scrapped, and some of its pieces were then used as landfill. Now, I don't know if there's some kind of overarching theme or idea to take away from the XFL story, other than the P-39 and its derivatives had a very strange history with the United States military. The P-39, initially built for the United States, served much more overseas. As an export aircraft, America initially wanted it, but then didn't want it, but still wanted it to sell it. America made it, but seldom used it. Then with its naval clone, you would imagine even if it didn't perform all that well, it would still be pretty ripe for export as well. But instead, they hated it so much that they used it for target practice and then threw it into a hole in the ground. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. For some reason, I can't get over the Aero Bonita name. I mean, why that? It was a derivative of the Aero Cobra, and in the same family as the later King Cobra. So where was the snake-based name? You know, why not the Sea Cobra? Or maybe the Aero Serpent? Ooh, I got a greater name for it, called the Aero Squid. I like that name. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!